Story time about the day my husband attacked me and put me in the hospital. Disclaimers is not my story time, sending me on Instagram. My husband and I had been married for seven years. Three years into the marriage, he started sleeping on the couch. We would constantly fight back then because of several things. Number one, I knew he was cheating on me, but he would never admit to it. Number two, I wanted to have children, but he didn't want to at the time. Number three, he never wanted to spend time with me and always prioritized his friends. And this was around the time that he started getting physically violent. Because we'd already been married for a few years at that point, I never saw him as a violent person. It all started by him shoving me one time during an argument. But he shoved me so hard I fell to the ground and ended up bruising my chin. And even though this was a big problem between me and him, it became an even bigger problem between me and my family. As soon as my parents saw the bruise, they started accusing him of beating me. And of course, my first instinct was to defend my husband. My parents begged me to stay with them and I didn't. I went back to my husband and demanded an apology. But he wouldn't even look me in the face. He told me he basically did not care. Once he started sleeping on the couch, it was just like we were roommates. We stayed like this for years. Anytime we got into an argument, he would just look for something to throw at me. One day he threw a jewelry box at me and I ended up in the ER. And of course, the hospital thought it was my husband. So I lied and said that I tripped. And unfortunately, I went straight back to my husband. Part two. Story time about the day my husband attacked me and put me in the hospital. Disclaimer, it's not my story time. I said I'm on Instagram. After years of him pushing me, shoving me, throwing things at me, and even slapping me, I became so numb to it. It would get me really angry and upset at the moment. But as soon as he would apologize, we would just go back to normal. But even our normal wasn't normal. We didn't sleep in the same bed. He was never really home, and when he was, he was always playing video games. This was also around the time that he lost his job. So for five years, I was basically the breadwinner. He told me he didn't want to get a job, and he wanted to play video games. I didn't tell him anything because I didn't want it to turn into a fight. But I was angry at the thought that I had to now support him. But like I said, my parents did not like him at all. They knew something was up because I always had some sort of bruise. My parents made it a habit of showing up unannounced to our house. I was actually really grateful to my parents, this didn't upset me at all. But my husband, on the other hand, hated my parents. One day he asked me, why do they even care about you so much? You're not that important. Around a year ago, I started feeling really sick all the time. At the time, I didn't know why. One day, I walk into the kitchen and see my husband holding eye drops in his hand, but he quickly put it away. I asked him why he was holding them. He said, nothing, mind your own business. So I did. A few months later, I'm having a conversation with a coworker, and he told me a story about somebody using eye drops on someone else to make them sick. This is when it all clicked. I had all these weird stomach issues and I never realized that it was him putting eye drops in my coffee. This is when I decided to file for divorce. Instead of filing for divorce and leaving him, I went home and told him that I was gonna get a divorce. He grabbed a hammer and started chasing me. I locked myself in the bathroom. Part three is up. Story time about the day my husband attacked me and put me in the hospital. Disclaimer is not my story time and sent me on Instagram. When I saw him grab the hammer, I started instantly running. I ran straight to the bathroom and locked myself. The good thing is that he would never damage this house because he does love it, so he didn't swing at the door. I stayed in the bathroom for an hour explaining to him why I wanted to get a divorce. After the two hours, I thought he had calmed down. He basically told me that he would give me the divorce with no problem. But let me remind you, I was the breadwinner and he had no job. He was completely dependent on me. But as soon as I opened the door, he pushed in and started hitting me. Unfortunately, I didn't tell anyone in my family what my plan was. Suddenly, I wake up and I realize I'm on the ground. Four hours had passed. I get up and look at myself in the mirror and my face was completely swollen. I walk into the living room and my husband was there playing video games, just like he did every day, all day. As soon as he sees me, he says, you better go wash your face. Instead, I grabbed my things and ran out. He didn't even bother chasing me. I called my parents on the way to the hospital and they met me there. Luckily, there was no major damage. My parents helped me file a police report. And when the police showed up to see my husband, he had cleaned the bathroom. Guess what he told them? That he was the one that wanted to divorce me because I was crazy and that I had made up the whole attack. He says that I must have hit myself in the face. That's when the cops asked him, how do you know that she was hit in the face? Gotcha. He said he had assumed that I was being hit in the face. My brothers and parents went over and kicked him out. I sold the place and bought a house down the street from my parents. I am now so much happier. I feel like I'm aging backwards from not being around him. The constant feel and nervousness I felt around him took a toll on me, and I just hadn't realized it. To this day, he says he did nothing, and the cops have done nothing against him. I need proof, so what should I do? Just imagine showing up to your own funeral after your husband put a hit on you. Even though this sounds like a totally made-up scenario, this actually happened for a woman. In 2004, a woman named Noella Rakundo immigrated from Burundi, East Africa to Melbourne, Australia as a refugee. At the time, she was a mother of five. She ended up meeting a man named Belanga Kalala. He was a refugee like she was and was currently working as a forklift operator. He had arrived in Melbourne in 2004 to flee a rebel army that had killed his wife and children when he was just 24 years old. Or this was his story that he told her. The both of them shared a social worker at the time. Kalala spoke English and Noella spoke Swahili, so the social worker would translate for the both of them. They ended up starting a relationship and moving together to Kings Park, which is in the suburbs of Melbourne, and they soon got married and had three children. This sounds like a completely romantic story, right? Well, things ended up taking a turn for the worse whenever Kalala began to suspect that Noella might be cheating on him. So what was Kalala's response to thinking his wife might be cheating on him without any proof? 
He paid nearly $7,000 to a group of men to kill her. Noella ended up getting news of her stepmother passing away, so she ended up flying back to her hometown for the funeral. This was January 21st of 2015. Kalala ended up calling her on the phone, and he instructed her to go outside and get some fresh air. And she was immediately confronted by an armed man who directed her to get into the vehicle. When she got into the vehicle, there was two other armed men waiting for her inside. They then blindfolded her, took her to a warehouse, and tied her to a chair. And instead of doing what they were hired to do, they ended up telling her about Kalala's plan. They had a personal moral rule not to kill women or children. So they let her know that her husband put a hit on her. She did not believe their original claims on what was happening, so they ended up calling Kalala, putting him on speaker, and asking what they should do next, and he responded with, kill her. Noella was so shocked by this information that she fainted hearing his response. So this is when they came together to make a plan to get- So because Noella didn't make it to her stepmother's funeral, her brother really started to worry. He called her hubby and asked him to send over money so the police could look into her disappearance. He did, and then on February 19th of 2015, the kidnappers dropped off Noella on the side of the road. They gave her all the evidence she needed to convict her husband of the crimes that he had committed, including a memory card. And they ended up telling her that she had about 80 hours to leave the country or other people might not spare her life like they did. After this, she ended up contacting the Kenyan and Belgian embassies to help her get back to Australia, in addition to getting a hold of her pastor, explaining the situation and that she was alive and needed help. Back in Melbourne, her husband was telling everyone that Noella had died in an accident. He then held her funeral on February 22nd of 2015, and as people left her funeral, she stepped right out of the car. Kalala walked up to her, touched her shoulder, and said, is it a ghost? To which she responded, surprise, I'm alive, and Kalala just started to profusely apologize. He was then sentenced to prison for nine years. On my Instagram, there's another case about a man who tried to kidnap